Are you still playing Nintendo? Then what you need is a Sega Dreamcast! With the Sega Dreamcast, you'll experience hours of fun and excitement with each and every game available. You'll be flabbergasted by all 128 bits. You want racing games? We've got only the best racing games on the planet that are guaranteed to make your heart palpitate. It's a Sega Dreamcast awesome? You bet it is. We've got fighting games, role-playing games, platform games, uh, extremely unique games, more role-playing games, more fighting games, even sports games. Everything you need to be a winner. We've got great graphics, but there's more. You can go online and play with other players from around the world. That is if you don't get disconnected. We've got the most spectacular library of games anywhere. So why mess around with that stinky Nintendo? Sega! Bring on the games! Sega Dreamcast! Available in limited quantities may cause leakage of the anal glands. Hello and welcome to Game Sack. Now as you've probably figured out, we're gonna spend this entire episode talking about the Sega Dreamcast and its games. The Dreamcast? I thought it was a Sega Dreamcatcher. Dumbass is the Dreamcast, you know that. <laughs> I do. Anyways, the poor Dreamcast, and it was an awesome system, but it had a really, really short lifespan. And even though it had a short lifespan, it made a huge impact on the world of video games. That it did. And with that said, let's take a closer look at the Dreamcast itself. The Sega Dreamcast launched in Japan in late November of 1998 in the U.S. on September 9, 1999. At the time, it was the biggest U.S. console launch ever. The magazines claimed it was a 128-bit console, but the main SH4 processor was 32-bit, whereas the graphics had 128-bit processing. The software was on GD-ROMs, which were the same size as standard CDs, but had the capacity of 1.2 gigabytes. The Dreamcast made sure that you knew when it was accessing a disc because the horrible, grinding sound of the laser could be heard from up to two miles away. The controller was a bit odd. It was modeled after the Saturn 3D control pad, but it removed two of the face buttons and made the remaining ones smaller. It also made the D-pad an analog stick out of a very hard and sharp plastic. The VMU accessory acted as a memory card and could display primitive graphics depending on what game you were playing. You could also transfer entire Dreamcast games to the VMU to play on the go. Oh wait, just kidding, you can't do that. Of course, the system had a standard AV output, but it also had a wide array of VGA boxes made by many different manufacturers which allowed for 480p on almost every game. The US version also came standard with a modem, but you could also get the optional broadband adapter for high-speed internet play. There were several games that took advantage of it, but unfortunately the servers no longer exist, though some games let you input your own. Many Dreamcast web browsers still work, but the internet looks pretty ugly if the sites you want to go to even load at all, though many still do. The system was discontinued less than two years after it was released and sold about 10.6 million units total. Yeah, Joe, the Dreamcast definitely is an awesome system. Uh -huh. uh, you know, but there has been reports of a lot of disk drive failures. Yeah, it wasn't the most reliable system ever made, Dave, but I've got to say, it's probably a little bit more rock solid than a lot of the modern consoles are coming out with these days. That's right. And they did try to change the design of the system midway through in an effort to thwart piracy, but I don't think that worked too well because it didn't stop pirates for very long. No, it didn't. That system was very easy to pirate games for. Do you think that's what killed it, Joe, do you think? Well, you know, it may have had a small bit of an impact, but overall, I don't really think so. Like I said, Dreamcast only sold about 10.6 million units, and Sega was bleeding money, so that's ultimately what doomed it in. But anyway, let's take a look at the Dreamcast games and yeah. see what they've got. Yeah, let's, awesome, let's do it. Samba de Amigo is an amazing rhythm game by Sonic Team. The first time I played this, I didn't think much of it as the music wasn't really my taste. But after playing the game a while, I got hooked. The game is insanely fun the more you play. There are two types of play styles. You can use the maracas or just the regular old controller. Watching Dave play with the maracas is more fun than playing the game itself. 
The object of the game is to shake your maraca or time your button push the moment the blue or red balls are in the center of the donut looking circles outside of your on-screen character. The closer you are to hitting the center of the circle, the more points you will get. As you are playing, you will be graded on how well you are or are not hitting the beats. If you do badly, your grade will drop and the background will become sad and dark. If you do great, your grade goes up and the background goes ballistic with colors and animation. It's truly a sight to see. Yeah, they're totally spazzing out. It's like they're on drugs or something. I love watching other people play as it gives me a chance to stare at the beautiful backgrounds. The game supports one or two players with many play options from arcade or original to challenge mode. At the time, logging online to Sega via this game would let you unlock new music already on the disc. Oh, I hate it when DLC is already on the disc. A lot of the music was from other Sega franchises such as Outrun, Afterburner, Rena Hero, etc. In 2007, Sega like Gearbox developed a Wii version of this game along with a Samba 2000 version. Naturally, they screwed it up, which is too bad. Overall, Sega did an amazing job with this game and it is one of my top three games for the Dreamcast. Soul Calibur. Soul Calibur was a launch game and also one of the few games that Namco released for the system. It's a sequel to Soul Edge or Soul Blade depending on your territory. At this time, the game blew everyone away with its crisp graphics and fast action. To be honest, it still holds up very well even today. Every character has seriously scary weapons. Did you just get cut with that gigantic sword? No problem, simply just get back up like anyone else would do. No visible flesh wounds at all. Swords and other extremely sharp objects don't actually damage the skin, so this is all perfectly reasonable. The gameplay is pretty much about mashing buttons to win, but if you like, there is some strategy to be had if you look hard enough. That doesn't mean it isn't fun though, because it is. It is a fun game. I really had fun with this one and got to enjoy most of the characters, though I'm not a huge fan of the newer games in the series. Yeah, there are other modes besides the basic story mode to help add a little bit of longevity, but it's really nothing amazing. The graphics, however, are outstanding for the time. Even the intro is 100% real-time Dreamcast graphics. The music is also excellent, though it sounds pretty scratchy and harsh as it is seriously hindered by the compression they use to store the audio. Still, this is probably my favorite Soul Calibur game and a definite must own for anyone who has a Dreamcast. I hope they made enough for all of you. Final battle, fight! <laughs> Jet Run Radio! <laughs> this is Jet Run Radio, bitches, up in your face! Let's get scratching. Jet Run Radio is another great game for the Dreamcast. This game revolves around a gang in Tokyo To. They need to expand their territory by painting graffiti all over the place. Really? That's all you need to do to acquire new territory? Sweet! Sega's legal department did a great job of shuffling responsibility for teaching kids that it's really, really cool to spray paint. They added a little bit of text before the game that loads up, stating that graffiti is wrong. Anyways, this is one of the earlier games that shows cell shading over traditional polygon graphics. The end result doesn't disappoint. By today's standards, the game is a bit dated, but it still does look great and is really fun to play. As you go along opening up new territories, you tag your graffiti all over the town and escape the police, etc. There's a DJ that blares a bunch of music by artists that I'm not aware of. This is awesome as the game stays fresh and you're not playing the game to music that was in the top 40, you know, 12 years ago, which now you probably don't like. The control is really good and spray painting large tags is really easy just using motions on the analog stick. The graphics are great and the colors in the game are really good. The soundtrack, like I said, is good and it really fits the style of the game completely. A sequel to the game was released on the Xbox, but in my opinion it wasn't as good as the original. There will be an HD remake coming this summer to your PSN and Xbox Live Arcade. Jet Set Radio! Radio. Ikaruga is a spiritual sequel to the Saturn game Radiant Silver Gun. A lot of people absolutely love this game, saying it is the best thing that mankind as a whole has ever accomplished. It's a vertical shoot 'em up and I'm not sure if it qualifies as a bullet hell shooter or not though. I would say it does, but you know, any shooter with more than 20 bullets on screen at once, I consider it pure hell. That's because you're not very good. 
Anyway, pretty much like all treasure games, this one has a gimmick to the gameplay. The gimmick here is that you can switch between light and dark ships and your shots are accordingly light and dark. When you're in light mode, you can absorb light shots from enemies without taking any damage. Likewise, when you're in the dark mode. Dark shots will damage light enemies more than light shots will and, of course, vice versa. It's a really cool concept, definitely. You'll find yourself switching back and forth like crazy in order to stay alive. It seems really cool at first, but I'll be honest, I grew tired of this game rather quickly. The gimmick was very fatiguing to use and you're constantly switching back and forth to the point where it becomes very annoying. The graphics are decent, but nothing really stands out at all. There's very little color in this game and the enemy designs look rather uninspired and generic. The music is alright, but again, nothing really noteworthy. Sorry fans, Ikaruga is a good game, it really is, but personally I'd rather play Radiant Silver Gun. Next up is Power Stone. You know, Capcom sure did show the Dreamcast a lot of love. This is a one or two player fighting game. It's set in stages that are littered with stuff to use as weapons like boxes, plants, benches, etc. Litter is bad. That's why you throw it at your enemy, jeez. You can even uncover weapons and treasure chests. The ultimate goal of this frantic game is to get the three Power Stones. Once you do, your fighter becomes a super fighter for a limited period of time. During this time, you can usually use a super projectile or a very hard to dodge super attack. The game is pure chaos and very fun. The graphics are really good for the time and have aged fairly well. The control is good and the music is, well, you know, the usual Capcom mediocrity. My only gripe is that this is a two-player game. Capcom fixed this in Power Stone 2 and added four-player support, but they really changed up the multiplayer in that version and I felt it was for the worse. I have a hard time keeping track of which player I am when there's so many on screen at the same time. It's just too chaotic. It's the same reason why Smash Brothers doesn't really appeal to me. <laughs> Dead or Alive 2 is another early Dreamcast game, this time by Tecmo. Dead or Alive started off as a poor man's Virtua Fighter, but with this game it's now more similar to Tekken as it's pure button mashing. But this game has well endowed women doing most of the fighting. You can select from a bunch of characters obviously and even change their costumes. Dennis Rodman is even in this game and he has one weird ass costume, look at that. It's like a silver Teletubby. The game has some sort of nonsensical story about, uh, you know, I have absolutely no clue what this game is about and it really doesn't matter. The button mashing is overall pretty fun, but the game rarely presents you with a challenge of any kind. I like all the different kinds of throws. Yeah, and I like the multi-level stages and the lack of ring outs. And somehow I was able to pull off this move that I thought existed only in the opening demo. <laughs> The graphics are excellent, there's really not much more to say about them than that. The music is pretty good too. Also, the programmers did an excellent job of hiding the loading times in this game. Usually when you win a fight, you're at the next stage ready for the next one immediately. This sucks if you're trying to enjoy a beer because you never have time to drink it. Ah Dave, I think you need to cut back on that stuff. Those were some interesting Dreamcast games, Joe. Yep. Are you going to mention Shenmue? Well, you know, I love Shenmue to death. It's one of my favorite games of all time, Dave. It really is. Mm -hmm. And I love Shenmue too as well. But of course, it didn't ever come out in America on the Dreamcast. But you know, we've already talked about Shenmue in depth. And so I'm not going to mention them in this episode. Yeah, that's right. It was in our episode number 33, Games yeah. That Cost Polarizing Opinions. Yeah. So here's a good idea. Maybe you could put a link under our video that, you know, points people directly to episode number 33. I have already done that, man. I am way ahead of you. It's directly below the video. You can even click on it with your mouse and just go straight and watch that. But first, stay here and watch some more Dreamcast games. We're not done yet. Confidential Mission is about as close to Virtua Cop as you're going to get on the Dreamcast. The manual doesn't mention it, but you can use a light gun with this game. That's because Sega never released their own light gun. In fact, I've never played this game without one. You control this sexy guy. Who are you? Howard Gibson. CMF secret agent. We have yep, he's almost always wearing a tuxedo. 
Of course, he's not very good at sneaking around as about a thousand bad guys are always ready to shoot you down no matter where you are. The gameplay is simple. Shoot the bad guys and don't shoot the innocent people. Also, don't get shot. Sometimes there are little mini games to add to the variety like shooting adhesive bullets at the vents to save yourself from poison gas or decoupling a train car. This adds a bit of variety to the gameplay and in a good way. Of course, being a light gun game, the screen flashes every time you pull the trigger and it might get a bit annoying, but it's still really fun. Yeah, it is really fun, um, and I usually get enough into the game where I don't even notice the screen flashing. It's much more fun than holding a Wii controller or a PlayStation Move. The graphics are pretty good for the time and they remind me a lot of Virtua Cop. The music definitely fits the game as well. Yeah, I know, I'm highlighting a tennis game, but when the tennis game is this good, you can't help but show it off. I'll admit that as I played this game for this episode, I noticed that the graphics have aged. I used to think that the player models were completely realistic. Now they look like they all have skin transplants or something. Yeah, skin transplants from a mannequin, maybe. Well, graphics don't always make a game, especially a sports game. What makes this game great is the control of your character. It controls so well you'll just want to keep playing and figuring out the ins and outs of a serve or where to hit the ball to make your opponent become unbalanced. The game has typical elements of a tennis game. Singles, doubles, exhibitions, circuit, etc. The graphics are pretty good when playing the game. The cutscenes of your character don't look so hot though. The music is fun as it's got some good guitar work and decent melodies. If you only have about a half hour to play a game, you can't go wrong with this one. Next up is Out Trigger by Sega. It's basically Sega's own attempt at making their own version of games like Quake 3 Arena, but instead this is a third person shooter and it has its roots in the arcades. It's a fun attempt, but in my opinion, not nearly as good as Quake 3 was. I agree, but I definitely prefer the third person perspective over Quake's first person view. Anyway, the single player mode has you running around destroying terrorists in extremely small environments. They just keep reappearing. The control takes some getting used to as a Dreamcast has only one analog pad, but once you figure it out, the control should be pretty much okay. Of course, this version had an online mode that was pretty fun that you can't play anymore. Ah yes, you can always count on online gaming to be there. I guess games aren't supposed to be enjoyed fully as they age. You know, Joe, this brings up a good point and makes me really think about purchasing games today that won't be playable in 10 years from now. Yep. The graphics are well done, certainly nothing to scoff at here, and I like the character designs. Yep, no fake toot here to ruin this game. The music also tends to be pretty catchy as well. The rumor has it that this has a LAN mode, but I don't know anyone else with a broadband adapter, so I can't even try it. One of the launch games for the Dreamcast was House of the Dead 2. It was a great liking game where you got to shoot down zombies. But this isn't the version of the game that I want to talk about here. Instead, let's take a look at the typing of the dead. You're basically playing House of the Dead 2 with a keyboard. Yes folks, here we have a typing tutor game. Only apply if you have the real typing skills. None of you two finger hunt and peckers should apply as you won't make it as far as real ten finger typers. That's why I have a tough time with it, you know. You're a pecker, aren't you, Joe? Anyways, words and phrases will pop up over zombie and monsters' heads and you've got to type them completely, punctuation and all, before the zombies attack you. The only thing this game is lenient about is capital letters. The game, as you can see, is a spoof. Your character walks around with a huge Dreamcast with a battery on his back and a keyboard on his chest. Enemies throw rubber mallets instead of knives. Every now and again your character will appear as a zombie. Why this happens, I don't even know. James, go and prevent the confusion in the city. Okay, let's meet at Sunset Bridge. We're counting on you, James. It's a great game to help you become a better typer. And if you're under this kind of pressure while typing in real life, <laughs> sheesh. I'm usually fine when I only have one or two words to knock out, but when there's a long phrase comes up, I do stumble. Oh, and the phrases are completely wacky in this game. Some of them are downright hilarious. A great game if you have the means to get it and a keyboard. Two player works really well and is great fun. You know Dave, I couldn't beat this game, but my mom did. True story. She's a secretary at her job and she could probably win the typing Olympics. She beat it on her first try. Do you know how humiliating that is? Don't kill me! 
help! My friends are inside! Help! I'd also like to quickly mention Toy Commander. A lot of people are big fans of this game. Basically, you're a kid playing with his toys pretending they are on real missions in the house. Like a helicopter dropping sugar cubes into coffee and whatnot. You can control different vehicles to accomplish the different tasks, all of which are defined for you at the beginning of the mission. I don't know, Joe. These graphics seem really dated to me. Well, they definitely are, but at least they're in widescreen, one of the few Dreamcast games with support for 16x9. The music and sound are pretty unmemorable, though. What the hell? Did this kid just flood his entire house just so he could have a water mission? Yeah, it looks that way. You should be glad you don't have a deviant child like this one, Dave. It's all fun and games until you have four feet of standing water all throughout your house. Yeah, I hope they have a mop. And a bucket. Anyway, this game never really grew on me like it did for others. You know, I can see some appeal, but I'd just rather not keep playing it. Well, Joe, that was definitely fun. I mean, no. how about that voice acting and typing of the dead? <laughs> it's almost as good as ours, man. <laughs> oh, man, just about. That Dreamcast sure has a lot of fun games to play. Yes, it sure does. Look at this thing. But longtime viewers will know our MO by now. That means we have a big montage of game. So sit back and watch. Man, Dave, it's so sad that the Dreamcast had such a short life. I really think they could have been a contender if Sega had done things properly. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I thought they sold a lot of units and were doing fine, but then they just failed or something. They just kind of dropped off and quit the race. They so. gave up. Yeah, well, whatever it is. But uh, it, there's still people making homebrew games for the system, though. 
that they are, but they don't really take advantage of everything the system can do, but I, I guess it's better than nothing, I suppose. Well, maybe, but, well, that's the Dreamcast for you, and we will see you in two very short weeks with a new episode. The new Dreamcast used 128 bits. Oh, yeah, the hell could that be? Yes? Can I help you? Hey! What are you doing? I hear you got a Dreamcast. Yeah, so? Can I play? No, it's mine. <laughs> Ow! Can I play now? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, let me hook it up. Uh, you like racing games? I got a real nice one. You know, this is a two-player game. Can I play two?